This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We're going to spend this session revising another topic that you've seen in your previous study. So it was introduced at F3. It was also then built upon in F7. And now we bring it to a triumphant conclusion in P2. Do we see it much? Not really in any of the recent exams but it's always worthwhile having an awareness, recapping everything that you've previously seen, just in case on the odd occasion it does actually present itself in front of you within the exam hall. So what we're looking at, as we said, is events after the reporting period covered by IAS 10. There shouldn't be anything that is too technically demanding of you within the exam. Remember, all that we're looking at is an event that happens between the reporting date and when the accounts are authorised for issue for publication to the shareholders. If things happen in between that period, then we need to assess the item to see whether or not it is either an adjusting event or a non-adjusting event, isn't it? And the key criteria is that an adjusting event gives you additional information about a condition that existed at the reporting date. If that condition did not exist at the reporting date, then whatever happens subsequently is therefore going to be a non-adjusting event. So the key aspect here is to look at what happened at the reporting date and has something happened subsequently that allows us to update our knowledge about what was in existence at the reporting date. If it does, we adjust for it. If the condition did not exist, then we make no adjustment whatsoever. The key, I think, within this standard is to learn the non-adjusting and the adjusting events. If you learn them, it makes life that bit easier come the real exam. If it crops up, it should only be worth a handful of marks. If that, I'd have thought maybe one or two marks maximum. Spotting that something happens after the reporting date and mentioning whether it's an adjusting or a non-adjusting event. So it's worthwhile spending a bit of time ensuring that you're happy with the rules within the standard. So let's go through, have a look at them. They are up there. Uh, and a lot of it ties into IS 37 to start off with, uh, because if you have the settlement of an outstanding court case, that goes through there and gives you a reliable estimate of the court case that was outstanding at the end of the year. So you can make a better estimate of your provision and update that provision at the end of the year. So a lot of the time when this standard is examined, there is a linkage with IS 37. The other scenario, however, is that maybe there is a bankruptcy of a customer. If your customer has gone bankrupt, they don't just go bankrupt overnight. The standard assumes that the customer was struggling at the reporting date. So therefore, we should go through there and impair the value of that receivable. So if you like tying into IS or IFRS 9 and looking at impairments and financial assets and how we go through and impair the value of that financial asset. It could be if they're bankrupt, we, we write it off in its entirety. Uh, sale of inventory at below cost. Again, that was another common one that you had in the days of F3, wasn't it? If the inventory that you have is now sold at, at less than what you originally bought it at, that's an indicator that the inventory is impaired. So at the reporting date, you need to reduce the value of the inventory to its realizable value uh, if it is therefore below the cost. Okay. So we, refer, so we refer to that as your inventory write down, isn't it? Uh, and then also, I suppose, maybe a bit newer, maybe a bit more relevant to P2, is that if maybe you have a non-current asset held for sale uh, and that is then disposed of by the end of the year, but you do not know what the selling price is. So it was held for sale. It was disposed of before the end of the year. So it isn't still a non-current asset held for sale at year end. It has been disposed of but you don't know what you are going to sell it for. Okay, There's an agreement that the sale is going to take place. We're negotiating the price. Once we know the price, we can work out the profit or loss on disposal. So if subsequent to the reporting date, we determine that price, then we can work out the profit or loss on disposal at the reporting date. Okay, there we have it. Uh, Non-adjusting uh, are falls in the value of investments because the, the assumptions, if you think about your efficient market hypothesis, is that information is impacted in the share price once it becomes known. 
and it's only known after the reporting date, isn't it? It won't have been in existence at that reporting date. It's only in existence when it is announced, which is after the reporting date. So therefore, the condition did not exist and the fall of the value of the investment is not adjusted for that reporting date. You just take the fair value of the investment at the reporting date and use that regardless of whether it goes up or down before the accounts are signed off. If you enter into the major purchase of assets, I suppose that then brings around your capital commitment notes. You don't go through and record it as an addition at the end of the year. You just disclose it, stating that we have purchased a significant amount of assets after the end of the year. At the year end, we had not purchased them, so therefore the condition did not exist. If you go through and announce a discontinued operation or a reconstruction uh, or restructuring after the reporting date, again, the condition didn't exist. It's only when you make the announcement that something becomes, if you like, uh, in the public domain and we can therefore then make the provision for your restructuring uh, or the redundancy so we do not go through there and make the provision at the year end we, we make the provision once the announcement has been made because that is when the obligation is created the obligation did not exist at the reporting date similarly for an item to be discontinued uh, it needs to be classified as held for sale or disposed of Again, clearly there at the reporting date, it wasn't held for sale because we did not meet the criteria. We only met the criteria in the post acquisition period. So therefore it will be discontinued from that point forward. Okay. Uh, important, not both, well, if I can get my words correct. Important point to note is that those non-adjusting events, we will disclose them if they are material. You can pick yourself up some additional bonus marks by saying that we disclose the nature. So what specifically happened and when. And also, if we can, any financial effect also. That's it. As you go along, you can go through there and add to the list of adjusting and non-adjusting events. And we may be able to do that as we go through there and play around with the following example. So the example that we have there. Uh, looks at some events after the reporting period. So I think I can just squeeze it in on the page there. And it says, explain how each of the above items should be treated in the financial statements for the year ended December X5. So presumably something happens after that reporting date and we need to determine whether it's adjusting or non-adjusting. Okay. So number one, it says the company makes an issue of 100,000 shares. So there has been an issue of shares, which raises 200,000 shortly after the statement of financial position date. Well, the issue took place after the reporting date. Uh, the shares weren't in issue at the reporting date, so the condition did not exist, did it? So therefore, what you have is any issue of shares is classified as a non-adjusting event. However, uh, 200,000 is quite significant, so it will be disclosed. Another really picky point that's contained within the standard that you may be curious or interested to note is that what you would actually go through and do, even though you don't record the issue of shares by debiting bank credit and share capital and crediting share premium, you do actually go through and update your earnings per share figure at the year end. So you would incorporate those 100,000 shares being an issue at the reporting date. Even though they're not, you will go through there and make the adjustment to give the user of the account a more faithful representation of what the earnings per share is, inclusive of that issue of shares shortly after the reporting date. So do just be careful. It's a non-adjusting event within the financial statements, but with regards to disclosure, you would disclose it as it is material, and you also update the disclosure with regards to your earnings per share. So just be aware of that tiny picky point that you have there. Uh, number two, illegal action have been brought against the company for breach of contract prior to the year end. So there was an outstanding court case at year end. And it says shortly after the SFP date, uh, it's been agreed the company will have to pay costs and damages totaling $80,000. Uh, no provision has currently been made, but it is giving us additional information about a condition that existed at the reporting date. So that will therefore be 
and adjusting event pointed. Okay, so we will record a provision at the reporting dates. Uh, number three, inventory included in the accounts at the year end at cost of 25,000 was sold for 15. Again, we have now sold the inventory at below cost. So that would be there once again as an adjusting event. We would need to reduce the inventory from 25 down to 15. So I would need to reduce the value of my closing inventory by $10,000. Number four, it says that a building in use at the statement of financial position, or financial position date and valued at 500,000 was completely destroyed by a fire. Uh, unfortunately, only half of the value was covered by insurance. The insurance company has agreed to pay 250,000 in accordance with the company's policy. Again, the fire took place after the reporting date. The condition did not exist at the reporting date. So that will be a non-adjusting event. Uh, it's material, so I would therefore consider it being disclosed within the financial statements. So you would disclose the nature, uh, so what happened, what building was destroyed, what it was valued at, and also as well what you can think about with regards to the financial effect, thinking there with regards to the fact that 250000 is going to be recovered back from the insurance company. The other 250000 the value or the remaining value of the business will just have to be written off and will be an expense or if you like an impairment of the building in subsequent years okay and in this following year following on from the reporting date so, so they're just you know four examples uh the fourth one fire that's quite common isn't it in the days of f3 and f7 not so much in in p2 uh if you want to throw it in there you can put in a flood a uh, fire and flood with a common non-adjusting events weren't they in f7 and, and f3 uh but p2 you have to read the question carefully. Note the reporting date in the requirement at the bottom. Then once you've noted the reporting date, always be aware of something that, that happens in the post-reporting date period and give consideration to whether or not it's adjusting or not adjusting. If you think it's not adjusting, don't just ignore it. State specifically that it is a non-adjusting event because that will then go through there and allow you to, to gain credit for it. Other than that, as I said, it, it's a pretty rare standard that you see. Uh, th there's never something that specifically focuses on IS-10. It tends to be examined with another standard. And in the past, we've seen it examined alongside IS-37 provisions and IFRS-5, your discontinued operations. But once again, another short, cute piece of accounting standard. And we shall call it a day.